Robert Crow. I'm a Google developer engineer, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, a journey, uh, a journey from experimentation to production uh, machine learning. Um, well, we start with the world. Uh, fundamentally, when we do machine learning, we're trying to model part of the world, uh, a process, an event, a goal, a behavior, something. We're trying to model something, some part of the world. So we look for information, things that will help our model understand the thing that we're modeling, things we can measure or that are already being measured. We look for data. And this is the same thing that we as humans do when we're trying to understand our world. Our model is no different, except that it's not quite as smart as we are in a, in a general sense. So as data scientists or machine learning engineers, we use our data to train our model. We start by experimenting. Typically that starts in a Jupyter notebook or a similar tool. Often, of course, we discover in the process that we need to change our data or look for better data, but eventually we hopefully get to a model that does a reasonably good job of modeling the thing that we're trying to model. And if we're in academia or in research, we turn in the assignment or publish the paper and we're done. But if we're creating our model to be part of a product or service that we're going to offer to the world, our journey has really only just begun. To put any piece of software into production, to use it in a product or service, we need a production uh, infrastructure and process. First, we need all the things that any uh, machine learning development needs, along with some special considerations because we're working in a production environment. So, assuming we're doing supervised learning, and most of the time we are, we, we're going to need labeled data. We need to make sure that that data covers the same feature space as the prediction requests that our model will receive. We need to minimize the dimensionality because we want the simplest possible model that is uh, the, that has the lowest cost to run and requires the, the least uh, CPU uh, infrastructure to, to run that model. But we wanna maximize the predictive information in that data. And we need to consider things like fairness and how we serve different parts of the people who are going to be using our model, different groups within our, maybe our customers or our users or our, our business process. And in many domains, we need to consider rare conditions. So especially in things like healthcare, we, we may have very rare conditions that we want to make sure that we model well because they're important. And we need to think about our data life cycle. So over the life of our application, uh, we need to constantly collect new data. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But along with all of that, as if that weren't enough, we also need to do what we need to do anytime we put a piece of software into production. So we need to consider scalability. Can, can we scale our infrastructure as our needs go up or down? Can we extend our, our uh, application and potentially our model as our business needs change or our, our organization if we're doing something like a nonprofit? Can we control and, and, and uh, change our, our infrastructure and our model through configuration, or do we actually have to write code to do that? Is our, our, our results consistent? Are they reproducible? If we give it the same data, do we get the same predictions? Have we designed a modular system where we can plug and unplug different parts of our system to improve or change things? 
And have we followed best practices? We need to do all of that in, in, a, in a production machine learning environment, um, which really means what we need is to, is to apply DevOps principles to machine learning use cases. So we need ML ops. There are various ways to define ML ops, uh, but I think this one says it well. ML ops is a ML engineering culture and practice that aims at unifying ML system development, dev, and ML system operation ops. Practicing ML ops means that you advocate for automation and monitoring at all steps of the ML system construction including integration, testing, releasing, deployment, and infrastructure management. And there's a link to a paper there that talks about that in some detail. But continuous integration is not the same as it would be in normal DevOps. Testing and validating code uh, and components is still part of continuous integration, but it also includes testing and validating data data schemas, and models. Continuous deployment is not just a single piece of software or service, but a whole system, an ML training pipeline. And we'll talk about ML pipelines more in a little bit. And that needs to automatically deploy another service, the model prediction service. So we have one service that is going to deploy another service. And we have continuous training too, which we don't have in DevOps. Continuous training is a new process that's unique to ML systems and, and it's concerned with automatically gathering and labeling new data, retraining our model and serving new models. So many teams have data scientists and ML researchers who can build state-of-the-art models but their process for building and deploying ML models is often entirely manual, as uh, shown in the diagram on this slide. And we consider this to be a basic level of maturity or level zero. It's a manual script driven and interactive process. Every step is manual, including data analysis and data preparation, model training and validation. The process assumes that your data science team manages a few models that don't change frequently, either changing model implementation or retraining the model with new data. A new version is deployed maybe a couple of times a year. There's no CI, CD, and, and of course, no continuous training. Model performance is evaluated infrequently and new training data is only gathered and labeled when the model is going to be retrained. And when models do need to be retrained, it's a fairly heavy and expensive process requiring ML engineers to manually gather data and retrain models. But why isn't one model good enough? Why can't we just train our models and be done? Well, let's, let's do a little thought experiment. So um, imagine that you're an online retailer and you're using a model of your click-through rates to help you decide how much inventory to order. Okay, that, that seems like it's a reasonable idea. But suddenly your AUC and prediction accuracy have dropped not on your whole inventory, but on one part of your inventory men's dress shoes well why why did why did our model suddenly start doing badly and more importantly how do we even know that we have a problem if all we have is our training data and our current click-through data how do we know that our model is no longer predicting our inventory ordering well well Unfortunately, we often find out the hard way. We, we either order way too much inventory or not enough. This is not the way that a business wants to discover that it has a problem with its model. 
So we need a process to make sure this doesn't happen and an infrastructure to support it. But going back to the question, why? Why, why did our model suddenly start doing badly when it worked fine before? Well, the answer is change. The world changes, our data changes, our business changes. If we're doing something like shoes, styles change. We, have, we may have new competitors. We may have uh, different suppliers. We, we, we may have, it's a different season of the year. Things change and our model has to change too. So in many domains, we need to constantly collect and label new data and retrain our models. But these things aren't free and we only want to spend our limited resources when we need to. So how do we know when we need more data or we need to retrain our model? What do we need to build to make this happen? Well, as data scientists or machine learning engineers, we tend to focus on our models and that's natural because really the modeling is what makes machine learning unique. It's, it's where the magic happens. But when we move to production ML, we discover that there's a lot more that is required to be successful. At Google, we've, we've measured the ML model code to be something like 5% of the total code necessary to train and deploy a model in production and keep it running. All the other tools and infrastructure that you see here are critical. And unfortunately, many people uh, who are just starting out find this out the hard way. Um, this is kind of a famous tweet now where uh, they trained a model in three weeks and 11 months later, it's still not deployed. Unfortunately, this is all too common. This whole topic was written about over five years ago now in a landmark paper called The Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. And if you haven't read it before, I highly recommend it. And, and there's a link there on the slide. Okay. So we have all these requirements, both machine learning requirements and infrastructure requirements and uh, ML ops requirements. How do we implement all of this? Well, I'm from Google, so I can tell you about what we do. We use ML everywhere in Google, in nearly every product or service from Google. And for the vast majority of it, we use TensorFlow Extended or TFX. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, TFX is not the only infrastructure that you can use for production ML but it's the one that I know mo the most about. And, and so I can explain to you how it works, but all production ML is going to be similar. It's going to have the same needs and the same requirements. So it's going to have to fill those somehow. And we use TFX and uh, it's used across uh, uh, really the, the alphabet companies. And you've probably been using it or really using products or services that are implemented using TFX. Um, yeah. And it's used, sorry? And it's used by, by our partners as well. So um, it, you probably recognize some names here and there's a, a nice quote from uh, Twitter about the productivity gains that they've seen since adopting TensorFlow and, and TFX. So TFX implements ML pipelines, which are the heart of a production ML deployment infrastructure. ML pipelines operationalize the ML training and serving processes. And this is a conceptual view of a TFX pipeline. At the top are the tasks that uh, we need to perform, which probably look familiar. They're the same that you do whenever you're going to train a, a, a model for ML. So it starts on the left with ingesting data and proceeds through training and serving the model. In the middle are open source libraries. These, this layer here 
Um, those are open source libraries that are used by TFX for particular parts of the process, like validating data and analyzing model performance. In orange are TFX components, which are what you use to define the pipeline itself. And this is a different view of a TFX pipeline. It's, it's what I call the hello world of TFX. So it's the pipeline that you start with when you're just doing a pip install, but then from here you can add to your, your pipeline or even remove some of these components or replace them. In orange, uh, you see the components for a training pipeline. And in green, you see components for a, a batch inference pipeline which is one way to serve the model that you train. Uh, the other ways to serve it are on, over here on the left, where we have uh, a repository like TensorFlow Hub, if you're gonna use your model for something like transfer learning or generating embeddings, TensorFlow Lite or TensorFlow JS. If you're gonna use your model in a JavaScript, maybe in a web browser uh, or a mobile application or IoT device, or TensorFlow serving, if you're going to serve your model uh, online or, or, or in a cluster, or wherever you can serve a, a model, really. So I mentioned components a couple of times. Let's take a look at what exactly is a component. There are three parts. There's a driver, an executor, and a publisher. The driver receives the input uh, for the component and supplies that to the executor where it really does the work of the component. That's what makes different components unique. And then the publisher takes the results of the executor and puts it into metadata, which we'll talk about in a second. So this is a different view of it. There's a configuration for each component. There's the component itself and it's getting its input from the metadata store, which we'll talk about some more. But what it's getting are, are artifacts. And it gets those over channels. So it gets its input over input channels. It takes its results, uses an output channel to put it back into metadata. So that's how different components communicate with each other. You have an upstream component that generates a result as an artifact that's put into metadata. Downstream components that depend on those artifacts then pull those uh, from metadata and use them and generate their results and put them into metadata. And then it flows downstream to the next component. So what that means is we need orchestration. We need to sequence and, and synchronize our tasks. And in TFX, there's different uh, orchestrators that are available and, and you can add your own. Uh, just out of the box, it comes with uh, support for Airflow, Kubeflow, an interactive orchestrator that we'll talk about a little bit, or a local orchestrator. You can run all of this just on your laptop. But regardless of which orchestrator you use, the, the pipeline itself is going to be the same. It's just going to look differently and you're gonna have a different UI for it. But the, the, the directed acyclic graph or DAG that, that forms a pipeline is gonna be the same uh, it, just in a different tool. One of the questions that we sometimes get is, uh, what is the difference between TFX and Kubeflow pipelines? And the difference is really that they're, they, they work together. Uh, TFX can run in a number of different environments, including uh, on your laptop or on a server or what have you. It can also run in a containerized environment using Kubeflow pipelines. And Kubeflow Pipelines itself forms the basis of uh, an offering from Google Cloud AI platform pipelines, but you can also run uh, Kubeflow Pipelines just on your own system. So it's also an open source uh, framework that's available. And it's, it's used a lot uh, as Kubernetes is used a lot. 
um, and TFX runs on top of it. So the bottom line here is that when you use TFX and uh, QFO pipelines together, you have the best of both worlds. And if you're running in a containerized environment, it's, it's a good option to have. We also have orchestration inside a notebook. So this is uh, for doing experiments or for doing iterative development. You, you build a pipeline in a, in a notebook. If you're using CoLab, you don't even have to install anything on your, your laptop. It just runs it all in a web browser. There's an interactive context that maintains the state, the context. So it maintains, it, it, does, it handles metadata management and it helps you uh, visualize the artifacts. Um, and once you've developed your pipeline, then you, you're, you're gonna move it to some other environment to run it in production. This is really only for development and experimentation. So I've mentioned metadata a few times now. Let's, let's look at what that is. As you run through the steps of an ML training process, so ingesting data and calculating statistics and doing feature engineering and training and measuring your metrics and so forth, you generate new data objects, which are known as metadata artifacts. So for TFX, we store our metadata artifacts in a metadata store. And so trained models, for example, are metadata artifacts and they have properties. They have a type, for example, which in this case is trained model. We also group those artifacts by the execution run, the pass through the pipeline that generated each of those artifacts. And that helps us later when we're trying to understand and analyze how the training went and, and understand the artifacts that were generated. So for example, it allows us to trace back through our pipeline and understand the sequence of operations that generated something. So for example, if we're looking at a metric and we're trying to understand why it's different than the metric that we had before, we can trace that back to the model that generated that metric. And then from there, we can trace that back to the data that we use to train that model and from there to the statistics on that data. So it helps us understand and, and monitor and analyze the process. So to do a lot of this, it can potentially require a lot of compute resources, especially when you're working with large models or, or large data sets. And to make that manageable, we use a distributed uh, pipeline uh, to run many of these processes on a compute cluster. And the pipeline that we use is called Apache Beam, which is an open source uh, framework for doing uh, distributed processing. Apache Beam is a unified batch and stream distributed processing API. It's a layer on top of other distributed processing platforms like Apache Spark, or Flink, or SAMHSA, or Google Cloud Dataflow, or what's called a direct runner if you're just running it all on your laptop. So the way this works is we have a number of different uh, underlying clusters or frameworks that we can run on, like Spark or Cloud Dataflow. And Beam has a number of different SDKs in different languages, which we can use. And for TFX, we're using Python. Beam sits in the middle of that, and it takes uh, operations and data using the, the Beam SDK. It translates that into the native SDK for whatever framework you're running on, and then a result is generated. Or looking at it a little differently, we have our component. And remember, we talked about the executor where the work is done. That could be running on a full operating system or in a Docker container. We have Beam. We create a Beam pipeline and send that off. That gets translated to the native SDK for whatever 
processing cluster we're using, it generates a result and that's translated back to the Beam uh, SDK and delivered back to our, our executor. So we're able to run those that processing on our cluster and, and take advantage of those compute resources. Okay. You might remember a little while ago, we talked about the Hello World pipeline. That, that The components in that are referred to as the standard components, and it, it looked like this. So I'm gonna go through these uh, fairly quickly, just so that you have a feel for it. But you'll notice that this mirrors a typical ML development process. So we start with ingesting our data, right? That's what we always start with. And for, for TFX, we use a component called example gen to ingest our data. And it actually uses Apache Beam to split that data and, and uh, it's gonna ingest different data formats as well. So there's a, a, a long, fairly long list of, of different formats that are available here. And you can see the configuration is, is very simple. This is for CSV, it would be different for, for different um, uh, data formats or sources of data. One of the things it does, uh, well, it splits our data into however many splits we need, usually at least training and evaluation. It also splits it into spans uh, so that we, we can, can uh, if we have a large amount of data, we can process it as individual spans across the data set. Uh, and this helps us uh, with, you know, large amounts of data that we wouldn't want to process the whole thing at, at once. It would be difficult to do that. The next component is statistics gen, and it uses uh, a library called TensorFlow Data Validation to calculate descriptive statistics for our data set, um, also using Beam for processing. So it's things like the median and mean and, and you know, standard deviation, the, the normal things that we use to, to examine and understand our data. And there's a visualization tool that comes with it that we can use in a notebook to understand our, our different features. So this is looking at one particular feature. Um, and we can see we might need some more data here at, at six in the morning. The next component is schema gen, which tries to uh, infer the types of our features. Now, it uh, oops, went, went too far. It does, it, it, it makes a best effort to do that, but you may be smarter. You may know more than schema gen does about your domain and your data. So you, you want to take a look at the schema that it generates and, you know, potentially make adjustments to curate that schema. Example validator takes the statistics and the schema and it looks for problems. So it looks for things like uh, examples where you have the wrong data type for, for a feature or the wrong category for a categorical feature, things like that. Transform is where the feature engineering is done. And the code for transform is really going to depend on the kinds of feature engineering that you need to do um, it's going to use the schema and, and the uh, uh, statistics that were generated, but it's, you're going to be writing code here to do your feature engineering. One of the important things that Transform does is it takes the transformations that you give it and it creates a TensorFlow graph from, that, from those transformations. So that graph is then prepended to your data um, when you train your model, it's prepended to your model rather, so that you're using that graph, those transformations to do the feature engineering for the data that you supply to the model. And that gets bundled with the model when it's deployed to serving, so you have exactly the same transformations. And it, it eliminates the potential for a training serving skew, the difference having different transformations because of different code paths between training and serving. The next component is trainer and trainer does what you imagine it, it trains a model. So when it does, it 
it's going to use your model code and it's going to save the results as a saved model. Um, that gets then used when you deploy your model and it also gets used for analyzing the performance of your model using TensorFlow model analysis. The, the configuration for your model is about what you think. It's, it's things like the numbers, number of steps and uh, you need to give it the schema that you've generated and the data that you've, you've, uh, you've uh, created, your, your data set. You also need to give it your model. So your model could be a TensorFlow model um, using either the Keras or Estimator API um, or just, you know, low-level TensorFlow if you want to do that. It could be a scikit-learn model. Uh, if you're training on Cloud AI platform, you could use XGBoost or PyTorch. Or actually, we have uh, uh, experimental support for that just in native TFX as well. Uh, there are advantages to using TensorFlow. Some of the some of the tools and libraries work better with TensorFlow, uh, but it's really up to you. You can train models using any of those frameworks. Um, one of the advantages of using, using TensorFlow is the ability to use TensorBoard, which is a great tool to understand your training process. Uh, that includes comparing different training runs. Uh, so you may have trained a model, uh, say, last month, and you want to compare that to the model that you're training now. Tuner uses the Keras tuning library uh, to uh, train your uh, to tune your hyperparameters for your model. Evaluator does deep analysis of your model performance. So what I mean by deep analysis is it's it's going to do uh, analysis of your your top uh, level uh, metrics, but it's also going to look at slices of data that you define to understand performance for different parts of your data. So going back to our example of shoes, you would slice out men's dress shoes to understand the performance for that particular part of your inventory. And there's a visualization tool that helps you understand that performance. Infra validator is used to make sure that you can actually run your model on the infrastructure that you have which is important because you want to make sure that it'll run before you deploy it. If both Infra Validator and Evaluator decide that your model is ready, Pusher will push it to whatever uh, deployment target that you're uh, using with your model. So it could be a mobile application or a web browser or a serving cluster or a cloud. Bulk infer, uh, which is one of the components in green in the in the diagram that we had before, is used for doing batch inference, and it uses uh, again Apache Beam to do that. So you can uh, distribute uh, that that those that batch inference uh, across your compute cluster. TFX also has pipeline nodes, which are not components. So there's special purpose classes for performing advanced metadata operations, things like importing external artifacts into metadata or doing queries of metadata. So importer node is one, and it's used for just that, for importing external uh, data or, or artifacts into your metadata store to use them with your pipeline. Resolver node is used to query the metadata that you have. So a typical case for this is something that evaluator does. It, it looks at the latest model and pulls it from metadata so that it can compare it to the model that you just trained. There's really two types of resolver nodes, the, the latest artifacts resolver that looks at whatever kinds of artifacts that you're, you're interested in and pulls the latest in, and the blessed model resolver that pulls the latest blessed model or the model that's in production now. There are also custom components. So you can create really three ways There's to create custom components. Uh, you can use a Python function with a decorator. We'll look at that in a second. You can run components, create components using containers. 
or you can just extend existing component classes using normal Python. At the end of the day, when you're when you create your component, you use it just like any other component in a TFX pipeline. So a Python based component looks something like this. You have a decorator, this at component at the top here. You have some annotations on your parameters and your output. There's an input and output artifact and you can have an arbitrary number of parameters and then there's an output. A container-based component is very similar, except that it's wrapped in this call here to create container component. But I use uh, these, these uh, artifacts to uh, declare the inputs. I also need to give it the, the container image to start from and a command to create that container. We also run on the cloud in, in Google, although you can also run on other clouds as well. Um, using cloud AI platform pipelines. And this is a very high level look at the architecture of it. It's, it's using TensorFlow uh, to, and that's being used by TensorFlow Extended or TFX. That's running on Kubeflow pipelines like we talked about earlier. That's running on a Kubernetes engine in, in the Google Cloud, it's Google, Google Kubernetes engine, which is using all the other cloud services like, like BigQuery and Dataflow and what have you. So that's TFX. They're standard components that you start with. You can apply flexible orchestration using one of the orchestrators that we supply. There's, or, or your own orchestrator. There's, there's metadata that uh, helps you understand uh, your processes and you can extend it, which you often, almost always will really with, with custom components. So, that's our production ML journey. We've looked at our world. We found ways to measure and collect data to understand it. And we've modeled it to give us a product or service that would otherwise be impossible to create in pure software alone. And if you're worried about the robot apocalypse, uh, don't be. Uh, the machine hasn't really learned anything. We have. One of the things we've learned is to create tools that we can use to create things that we value, products and services that we want. That includes tools like TFX, which enable us to take our experiments and use ML to create robust, sustainable products and services and offer them to the world. Here's our website. If you haven't seen it before, uh, tensorflow.org slash TFX. And here's some more links uh, to help you get started.